I'd like to start off by welcoming everybody. Um, I'm really glad to see the turnout. And a big thank you to our sponsors, as uh, Frank mentioned, Ligon and Dana and Eisner Ampner. So the title of my talk is Working with the Office of Industrial Liaison. Um, I'd like to start off by narrating an experience I had. A scientist one came, once came up to me and said, I decided to start my new, I've decided to start my new business because my boss said something to me. So I said, what did he say? He said, you're fired. <laughs> so whatever is the reason you guys are here today, I think you know, whatever the reason is for you guys wanting to be an entrepreneur, I, think, I don't think you can be in a better place than NYU, and I think coming here today is a good first step. My talk is going to be divided into three different parts. Um, the first is background regarding you know, what industrial liaison has done to date, um, the process of working with industrial liaison, and lastly, if you want to start a company, um, how, and, you know, how do you interact with the Office of Industrial Liaison and what the Office of Industrial Liaison can do for you? So the mission statement of the of our office is that we, are, we promote the commercial development of NYU technologies into products to benefit patients and society, and in the process, provide a return to the university to support the university's research and education missions. This is, um, so you can see our track, you can see from the next couple of slides, our track record has been pretty good. Um, we have research expenditure, that's the, these are the monies flowing into NYU, of almost $300 million. Um, just, in 2000, just for the numbers for 2010, we had about 130 disclosures. We've had the same in 2011. Um, we're just finishing up the numbers for that, so their numbers are not in here. We signed about 38 licenses. To date, we've had about 538 patents issued. And out of those, we've licensed um, 312 patents. We have about 24 products on the market and we have 13 products in clinical trials. Um, but the most, I think, one of the more important numbers is the number of startups we've had to date. And th that number is about 70, which I think is a, a really a phenomenal number. We've been in amongst the top 10 universities as far as license income goes in terms of you know, licensing the patents out. Um, if you look at activity per $100 million of research funding flowing into NYU, the rate at which we start companies is actually um, better than most other US universities. And this is an independent research. It was not commissioned by us. Um, these are some of the products that are currently on the market. Remicade, which is our blockbuster drug, first came to market as a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis and subsequently got approval for many other indications. Sutent, the same. Right now the sales are about a billion worldwide. Um, first approved for kidney cancer and then subsequent approvals for stomach cancer. Oresia and, and Zinicard and two other products. Um, throughout this presentation, you might see me alluding more. I mean, when I give you examples, they may be more life science or biocentric. And that's just because that's my background, and that's what I deal with most. But that doesn't mean that that's all we do here at NYU. Our office caters, our office manages the intellectual property generated at Washington Square, at NYU Langone Medical Center, and all its affiliates like the VA Medical Center, Red JD, Dental School. So we're, we're handling all different types of technology. One prime example is, if you remember, election night, a couple of years ago, John King was using the screen, and it was fascinating how he was moving the states from you know one place to another, and uh, I mean the numbers and showing us different things. That technology was developed by an NYU spin-off called Perceptive Pixel. So next election night, you can think about Perceptive Pixel rather than the outcome of the election. We have, as I mentioned before, we have several products in clinical trials, and these are just some examples. Um, as you can see, we have you know, drugs spanning all different indications, cancer, Alzheimer's, different devices, uh, vaccines. And then our startup activity. 
We ha I, I mentioned this number before. We have 70, 70 companies formed to date, 32 in the last five years, and nine actually in the previous year. Um, altogether, these companies have raised more, more than a billion dollars. Six companies went public, and six got acquired. And the examples here are some of the companies that came out of NYU. And um, you know, NYU is a place that recognizes that entrepreneurship is much more than just you know creating you know just forming the startup and and you know getting royalties. It creates jobs, and I think that's really an important contributor to the economy. This is just a slide that I found that. Um, on the website of the University of Virginia Patent Foundation, and I thought it was very interesting. If you look at most technologies that come out of universities, they're very early stage. And the level of involvement when the idea, when it's just an idea, is more at the university. And then as you make, start to make a product and try to commercialize, it, it will, as, as, it's, as it's, you know, logical, it moves more towards the company side. What's happening nowadays is you're seeing this yellow you know, area where the university involvement is, um, is necessary sort of shift towards the company side so that scientists are involved in product development as well. And, 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 and that's a reflection of the fact that you're going to see more startups and you're going to see more scientists involvement in commercializing the technology. NYU, again, you'll hear more about this uh, in subsequent sessions, but we make a lot of effort to promote entrepreneurship. Um, our office administers um, the Applied Research Support Fund, and this is for commercially promising technologies that need just that little bit of money to either you know, make a prototype or, or provide some proof of concept uh, type experiments so that it becomes, the technology then becomes commercially attractive to um, our partners, either in pharma or, or, or in the physical science uh, arena. Um, we talked about the NYU Venture Fund. You'll hear more about it. We also partner with several other institutions and organizations like um, the BioAccelerate that's run by the New York City Investment Fund, the Pfizer Center for um, uh, Therapeutic Innovation. Um, our office runs a biotechnology venture um, internship where um, postgrads and graduate students can actually come in and work with us over a period of three or four months. Uh, we, give the, we give them certain technologies to work on, on developing a business plan. And as they go through that process, they, they learn how to put a business plan together. They learn what it needs to, to develop and commercialize the technology. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit about um, how do you work with the Office of Industrial Liaison? Um, you have an idea. So when you have that idea, what do you do? You call, call us. Um, and when I say call us, who do you call? So this is our office. Um, Abram Goldfinger is our executive director. Andrew Koopman, whose picture looks a little bit fuzzy because I think he clipped it from some bar mitzvah that he was attending. Um, <laughs> But I, I think he's going to be here um, soon. Um, this is me, and um, Bob Fector is our guy at Washington Square. Bob mostly handles um, inventions and, and technologies that are in the physical sciences arena. Bob also handles things um, um, that come out of um, the medical center, like imaging technologies and technologies that are related to medical devices. Um, and Nadeem Shahdi um, joined our office about a year and a half ago. So this is our website. Um, you know, look us up on the web, and, and you can call any one of us. Uh, between the five of us, we have um, uh, a lot of experience. We've worked in different industries. And uh, you know, we're here to help you um, address whatever questions you have. So when you do call us, what happens? You, we, talk, we talk to each other. And we first try to find out what is it that you have? You know, what type of IP do you have? Is, it, you know, is, is the idea that you have, could it be covered? Does it need to be covered by a patent? Does it have to have copyright protection? Is it a trademark? Is it a trade secret? Or is it just a proprietary material? Is it just a new transgenic mouse that you don't really need to file a patent on? You know, just by virtue of being in possession of the material, you can control its dissemination. 
So when, well, after we have this initial conversation, we typically ask you to file an invention disclosure form, and also if you can provide us with a summary of your work. Now, why is this form necessary? This form enables us to understand your invention better beyond our initial discussion. This form has certain, certain sections in it, like was there federal funding? We, as a university, we have obligations to the federal government that if you make inventions using federal funding, you're supposed to report it. This form has a section that will ask you, did you make the invention using material that someone else provided? Because if you did, then you need to go back, we need to go back and look at that agreement that's, that, that was in place so that you know, we want to make sure we have no obligations to whoever provided you the material to make that invention. And what happens once you fill out the form? There's, a, there's an evaluation process. And what does that evaluation process consist of? Um, it's a triage. We do a patentability search. We do what we call prior art search. And throughout this presentation, whenever you see an asterisk mark, that means that um, our next speaker is going to go into details about what that term means. And, and I'm not going to delve too much, because I want to focus on the whole aspect of working with the Office of Industrial Liaison. I'll leave the IP basics uh, to the experts. Um, so going, again, I want to step back. Patentability, so very briefly, to get a patent in the patent with the US Patent Office, you need to show that your invention has utility, it has novelty, it is not obvious that if you, oh, there's Andrew Koopman, okay. Um, if it, it, your invention should be um, not obvious, and um, I guess um, Joseph will talk about enablement and best mode. So I wanted to throw a challenge out there. I don't know how well you can read this. I, I can't read it myself anyway. Um, I've redacted the name of the inventor on this patent. It's a method and means for creating an anti-gravity illusion. Um, and just to read the abstract, if you're not able to read it, it's a system for allowing a shoe wearer to lean forwardly beyond his center of gravity by virtue of wearing a specially designed pair of shoes and whatever, you know. So if, if by the end of this presentation, if you guys can guess who the inventor might be and what this invention is, this, you Googled it. <laughs> well, yeah, you deserve a prize. Whoever answered first. I, I heard two voices. You did? You you the into the oh, there she is, OK. You're going to have to duke it out, but there is a prize. <laughs> Sorry, will you? Oh, OK. I don't know if everybody heard. This is Michael Jackson's shoe that he got a patent for his, I would say, patented moonwalking move. Yeah. That's a smart. Wow. Um, just a little bit about prior art. Um, when you make an invention and you want to get patent protection, very important not to make a public disclosure. Um, Talk to the Office of Industrial Liaison before you go public with your disclosure. And what does public disclosure mean? If you post your invention on a website, you have conversations with someone outside the university without a confidentiality agreement in place. You get your post or, or abstract accepted at a meeting, and the abstract appears online before the meeting. The date the abstract appears online is your date of disclosure. And you have like one year grace period in the US, but you have absolutely no grace period outside of the United States. And, and the last but not the least, especially if you're an entrepreneur and you have ideas, if you're submitting a product development opportunity to a <coughs> possible you know, venture group um, that you don't have an agreement in place ahead of time, that's public disclosure. So again, I can't emphasize enough, if you have an idea, um, do not go public with it unless you, you know, until you've discussed it with the Office of Industrial Liaison. Um, you know, we can guide you in terms of what you could disclose. Um, I want to emphasize this, and this is very important. Our office has a mandate. If, you, if you're a scientist, our office has a mandate that we work with your publication schedules. You'll almost never uh, hear or say, well, don't send this abstract or don't publish. We'll work with whatever schedule you have but it's always good for us to know ahead of time 
if you are planning publications, especially if they are to do with ideas that are going to be you know, valuable. And if you have a doubt whether you think this is a valuable idea or not, still talk to us. You know, we'll help. We'll figure it out together. Again, you, know, you may see a couple of slides about this. You know, think pattern before you publish. Um, we're here to help. This is a very complicated slide. It's a very, you know, but it's just to, to let you know that the patent process, once it begins, is a long and protracted one. And, and Joe will go probably more into detail about this process. But the reason you need to know that is, is if, you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're planning to protect, to, to, to file patents, you need to know how long it takes for a patent to actually issue, you know, how long this whole process actually takes. You need to know how much it's going to cost. Um, patenting costs are big, because when you license a patent from someone, you're going to have to pay them the patent cost. Um, it takes anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. Then this is you know, probably more to file a provisional. Depends on how good the provisional is. Um, and Joe, again, will talk more about what a provisional application is. Um, and you can see these numbers. They aren't, they aren't um, you know, uh, patents don't come cheap. So again, if you, if you are in a constant dialogue, then we can figure out when is a good time to file a patent and, and what, uh, what should be patent. Who pays those costs? Sorry? Who pays the costs? Um, NYU <coughs> pays for this cost. So that's the advantage you have, that when you make an invention and you disclose it to us, um, and why you takes up all the, you know, pays for all the upfront patenting costs. And when the technology is licensed, whether it's to a existing company or you know, a pharma company or, or um, the um, the license agreement will state that the licensee will pay for whatever cost NYU has incurred to date till the signing of the license, and then any ongoing cost. All right, so we're done with, you know, we did the patentability, we did all, you know, and we, our office will do some prior art searching to just check whether somebody's already disclosed the idea that you think um, you had for the first time. And then there's a big question about marketability and commercial potential. Um, Andrew and I were just talking, and, and Andrew said something, you know, you're not to be, you have to be, what is it, first in place and, and then. First or best in place, you know, that's the criteria. I mean, if you make, if you, you know, we already have Advil, Motrim, Aleve on the market. If you make another drug that works equally well, is there, is there a need for it? I mean, is, there, would, can some, is someone going to come in and take a license to, to something that satisfies, you know, uh, that there's already, there, there is a market, there already is a drug on the market for? I mean, if you have a drug that, prevents a headache even before it starts, then, then tell me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, one has to think about these things. Is, is it, is it, is it, <coughs> but sometimes you may come up with a new use for a known drug. Now, that's interesting. That's something that companies are interested in. So, again, these are discussions, you know, the patentability, the marketability, the commercial potential. These are all discussions that we will have with each other. You know, we will raise these concerns, and maybe you will tell us, no, you know what? That's not the case. You, the, you know, the, it's not what you think it is. And maybe you'll make a case yeah. for, um, for something to be, um, you'll convince us that it ind indeed is novel. And, and, and amongst all these talk, you know, it's important to remember why you should protect your IP. And I think one of the main reasons is that you get Protecting your IP helps you get your technology to the public because then you're going to find a partner to commercialize your idea. It helps you as a scientist to generate funding because hopefully that partner that we found is going to sponsor research in your lab. It's going to help you advance your career. Um, you're obligated to because there are a lot of federal requirements that say that if you make inventions, then you're going to have to report them. So that's just, it's not our office saying that, it's federal law. There's a lot of personal gain. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but NYU is one of the most generous uh, universities as far as sharing any royalties in, um, you know, in licensed technology goes. We, when, just for example, if we make 100,000 of a license, 
15 percent, 15,000 goes to the overhead cost. The other 85,000 is split 50-50 between NYU and the inventors so that the inventors as a group actually end up getting 42,500. If it's one inventor, he gets the 42,000, he or she gets the 42,500. If it's a group of inventors, they split that, among, that amount amongst themselves in whatever ratio they have mutually agreed upon. Um, if you go to Cornell, I mean, their rate is like, what is it, 30% or 23%, I'm not sure. But NYU is, shares equally in net income with the inventors. And last but not the least, you know, you protect your IP and you're actually able to make an impact. If, you're, if your invention is a diagnostic, for example, for detecting TB in a third world country, ima imagine the impact of early detection. That, that's just great. Again, this is something that our next speaker will touch upon. Um, so this is the process. You have the invention disclosure. We did an evaluation. We filed patents. And now our office will engage in what we call marketing efforts. We'll take the technology, and we, we have sort of a mental Rolodex going on in our minds. OK, this is a device technology, and maybe so-and-so might be interested. You know, and we will go and approach those companies to try and, and commercialize the technology. We'll present the opportunity at various meetings and, and, and you know, seminars to interested parties. We do a lot of networking. And, and hopefully, you know, we license the technology. Sometimes the technology gets licensed to a big company, an existing company. And sometimes it's the basis for starting a new company. Um, again, you know, a lot of things go into deciding. It's, again, the dialogue between the inventor, the founder, and, and Office of Industrial Liaison. Does the technology lend itself to being the basis for a startup? Um, and when we do enter into these agreements, we negotiate the licensing terms. We negotiate what the upfront fees will be for the technology. We negotiate what the royalty rate will be and what, if any, will have, you know, what milestone payments will we get paid when the company reaches a certain milestone for that product. Um, sometimes the li it's not just licensing. There's also research funding involved. Um, <coughs> I'm asked many times, you know, how does, how does this thing work? What happens when I have an idea? Well, you have an idea, you make an invention disclosure, we file a patent, and you assign rights. You are the inventor of the patent, but the ownership of the patent resides with NYU. And so you assign your rights in the patent to NYU. NYU is the owner of the patent. And this is a very, very simplistic um, diagram of how the relationship between um, NYU and a possible in founder entrepreneur works for a technology. So this is NYU in red, and NYU gives you know a salary and provides resources to the scientist and the would-be entrepreneur. The entrepreneur then sends us you know discloses the inventions to us. We file patents on these disclosures, and then th if there's a new company that's being formed. We license the patent rights, or we option the rights in these new inventions to the new company. I'm not going to go into details about how a new company started and, and, and you know, who starts it and, and how do you go about raising money. All that is going to be covered in, in, in subsequent classes. But just for the purpose of this talk, there is a new company. And now there's a relationship between this new company and the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur could be a founding member of the company or it could just be um, you know, that we, our Office of Industrial Liaison, brought a new party to the table that decided they were going to start a company based on the technology. Um, and then the entrepreneur is, is not really a founding member. But anyway, the, the, there's a new company. And then now the entrepreneur is going to get some stock from the company. The new company, in return for these patent rights, is going to, am I running on short on time? Okay. Mm -hmm. The new company, in return for the patent rights, is going to give stock, royalties, maybe research funding, back to NYU. And then, and like as I mentioned, whatever compensation NYU gets from the company is shared equally with the, with the, with the inventor. Um, so now, there's a complex relationship going on here. If the, if the entrepreneur is a founding member of the company, he or she needs to decide 
if he is the person that's going to, he or she's going to person that's going to do all the negotiations for the company. For example, we at NYU, you know, license the technology as a new company. Is the entrepreneur going to sit here as a new company? <coughs> for, and it has happened in the past. I mean, we've had scientists, um, they come to us with inventions, we license them to the founding company, and we are negotiating with the scientist, and we're negotiating for the best possible terms. And we say, you know, we want a certain royalty and we want certain license fees. And the entrepreneur now goes to the, you know, is now, is now interacting with us as a licensee and says, no, I can't pay you that, that percentage royalty. And then, he, and then we say, okay, fine, we're, we're, you are a new company. You don't have as much money to pay us up front. We'll settle for a certain amount of equity because maybe we'll make money when you make money. Then the entrepreneur switch, switches to the other side of the table and says to me, how did you negotiate such a low royalty? You know? So I say to them, make up your mind. Whose side are you on? You know? But then again, this, this is where we need to talk. This is where we need to be engaged in a dialogue all the time. We are not new to this scenario. We are used to doing this all the time. And we know how to make this path smoother and, and, and you know, hassle-free. Again, the, the, the underlying theme of my talk is that you, know, you work with us, we'll help you understand where the conflicts of interest lie, we'll help you understand that if you are, a, you are an MD and you want to run a clinical trial funded by the company you started, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, that's, that's a straight off conflict of interest. You could absolutely have research funding flowing in from the company, that's, that's, that's not a problem. Um, again, you know, work with, work with industrial liaison because we need to be in touch all the time as far as patent prosecution goes. If the new company is gonna, has licensed patents, we need to make decisions about when and where to file, you know, and, 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 and you know, many small things need to be ironed out. We could help you make introductions to collaborators that could help you develop your technology faster. We could help make introductions to funding resources. You know, we have, we have contacts at the SBIR, STTR. We constantly know of new programs that are being announced. So, so work with us and uh, we're, we'll help you out. Um, there are so, if, you are, if you are a founding entrepreneur, there are some things that you absolutely could do that NYU has actually encouraged uh, founding entrepreneurs to do. You could serve as a consultant to the new company. You could head up the scientific advisory board or just be a part of it. You could hold equity in the new company. So um, there were very, um, we, we encourage all these activities. If you want to hold, we're a little bit wary about scientists holding CEO, CFO, or CSO, or paid positions with the company. And that's more because you know, there are fiduciary responsibilities that come with being in those positions. And you should be thinking very carefully whether you want those responsibilities in addition to your employment here at NYU. I talked a little bit about conflict resolution, you know, the sponsored funding. Um, you absolutely can have sponsored funding coming from the company. You can be a consultant and you could receive compensation from the company. I was going to play the sound thinking nobody was going to guess that this was <laughs> dangerous, you know. But I, you beat me to it. This is Michael Jackson. So in conclusion, all, one, um, all I want to say is, you know, protect your IP, protect it early enough. Um, again, talk to industrial liaison um, early and often. And we're here to help you figure out what's the best um, action to take at whatever time you approach us. You know. So I have time for questions? OK. <coughs> Any questions? Yes. So you said that if you're a clinician and you, have, you want to run a clinical trial, you cannot do the PI spec clinical trial if you, if you have a patent on that spec, is that correct? Right. But can the university run a clinical trial? Absolutely. Someone else could run it for them. But, but who, how does that work? Well, we have a conflict of interest. Um, Oh, sorry, I, think the, uh, I don't think everybody heard the question. My, she was trying to clarify that if you are an MD and you are the founding member of a company, 
can you run a clinic? You're not supposed to run a clinical trial. Um, can someone else run it? Yes, they possibly could, but it has to go through the conflicts of interest committee to make sure that it's you know, far removed from any conflict. Um, sir. You, you mentioned that uh, you need to file a different patent for each country. Um, do they all have to be done up front, or can, can they be added um, down the line? There's a timing issue with that, and I think um, Joe will touch more upon how, how that goes. But typically, you file a provisional patent. A year from then, you file a PCT, which is you know, sort of reserving your rights in different countries all over the world. And then 18 months from that formal filing date is when you decide to enter in individual countries. And you have to decide then. It can be that you drop it then, and then you take it up again later. Is there any different structure? Um, as you mentioned, the, the triple between the inventor, NYU, and the company. Is there any other way, for instance, that an uh, individual inventor would maybe partner with NYU itself, that NYU could pres uh, provide some sort of protection? Because the essence of patents, it's maybe the initial cost, you know, 40, 50,000 to patent, but the biggest cost is more to protect it or when people come after you or you're dealing with other things like that. So is there any sort of structure like that? that if, the, if, if the technology is licensed, then the commercial partner is responsible for managing, you know, any infringement of the patent. If the technology is licensed, which means, again, you know, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. If it's not licensed, that means there is there is someone even going to infringe it if it's not, you know, maybe it's maybe it's not, you know, it's not a product that's on the market, right? You know? right. So, if you're asking if NYU will go after someone because they're infringing a patent. Um, Again, it's case by case basis. If we think there's value in it, we might. Yeah. Very unlikely if we don't have a commercial partner. Yes. Is there a way to collaborate with other academics from other institutions? Is your question is there room to collaborate <laughs> with other institutions? Um, that's routinely done. I mean, you know, scientists are interacting with other um, scientists all the time, and sometimes they come to us with inventions that are jointly made. <coughs> so we're, I don't know if I'm answering your question, we're very used to handling inventions that are made by people from different institutions. And they can also go on to form a company and they'll work with the other tech transfer. The other yeah. Um, Explain to them also that if you want to make a company and you have collaborate, collaborators at other universities, you'll work with the other tech transfer. Right. So you might want to repeat that. Right? <laughs> if you, <laughs> Sorry. What Marissa was trying to um, clarify that was that if, if the technology is jointly owned, we will make sure that we will you know, interact with the other universities <coughs> and make sure all the rights are under one umbrella and that you, know, you, we, you can leave that to us. We'll take care of that. We have had technologies that we've jointly owned with Harvard and Columbia and, and, and you know, license them as one portfolio. It's, it's very routinely done. It's not a problem. Okay. Apparently, Marissa says this is it, and, and I'm, 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 I'm around at the networking reception, so feel free to come and talk to me. You know. And then whoever got the answer, you, I have a prize for you at the reception. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a litigator by trade, um, so for me, the procurement process, what we're about to discuss today, is one step in perfecting your rights um, and asserting those rights against others. Um, let me ask you a question. If you have a patent, can you practice your invention? Does anyone know? Do you have a right to practice your invention? Not always. Not always. I think you were alluding to that before, right? Um, actually, a patent is a right to exclude others. How about a trademark? Same thing. It's a right to ex exclude others from confusing your products with theirs in the marketplace. How about a copyright? 
exactly the same thing. I can't look at Napster. I can't take someone else's digital file and just copy it without their permission. What we're talking about is gaining permission for your inventions. It's an interesting concept. It's a quid pro quo between you and the U.S. government, right? We, we tend to forget about that. They're the ones who generate those rights. This scope that we're going to be talking about, I'm going to race through copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets because my feel for you guys is that you're really interested in patents, which, quite frankly, expire right, before the others, and in some ways cannot be as valuable, depending on the type of IP. If I asked you the most valuable IP in the world, would you be surprised that it was the Coca-Cola mark? Right? But anyway, we'll talk about them. Um, I just want to bring you back to something that you might not study in medical school the way we study in law school. And this is the article of the Constitution that says, the reason for IP is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. As, it, as you may or may not know, do you know who the first commissioner of patents was in the United States? Tom Jefferson, right? And to this day, patents have a very odd shape and size. Well, size more than shape. And that is because they are designed to fit in Thomas Jefferson's shoebox, okay, to this day. So now you know how arcane the United States Patent and Trademark Office can be and how interesting some of their rules are. Uh, we try and be very accurate about inventorship, ownership, and the right to enforce our intellectual property. Um, okay, I will race through these. In fact, I am told that you will have access to these slides. Uh, so if you don't want to hear about copyright, I don't need to talk about it. I, we can go real fast. It's a legal right granted to authors. For fixed, the, the original work has to be fixed in a tangible medium, medium of expression. So I can't copyright my speech, but I can copyright the transcript of my speech, in other words. <clears throat> Just some examples, right? Books, pieces of art, uh, television programming, um, music. These are all copyrights. Right? They're very effective. It's great. Wait till you see the term. OK, now, what's not protectable? You can't protect an idea. You can't protect a slogan for a copyright. You can't protect clothing designs, although I think that might be changing soon. Um, you can't copyright facts, right? None of those things are copyrightable. Okay, but this is great. The life of the author plus 70 years, a long time. Write a successful book, and you'll have much more ec economic success than a patent, more than likely. Um, this is, copyrights are a bundle of rights. Okay, so you have the right to reproduce, you have adaptive rights, you have the right to distribute, you have the right to performance, and you have a display right. All of those can be separately parsed out and licensed separately in books. So I can take my book and I can make a movie out of it. I could take my book and I can have an illustrator do something with it. I can take my book and I could make an e-book e out of it. All of those are separate rights that can be parsed out and collected for. And it's not all about money, it's also about distributing. I don't, want, I don't want anybody to think that IP is really all about money. It's not. In fact, protecting IP, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, allows you to drive that invention into the marketplace. Without that, did anybody ever wonder why you can work and you could find in the chemical arts natural compounds that have biological effect and no one brings them to market. And why is that? Because you can't protect the compound. You can't pay for that compound to go through clinical studies. You can't pay to advertise it. You can't pay to detail it. Right? So uh, oftentimes, what happens to your invention, what happens to your book, what happens to your trade name, will be dependent on how you conform to the rules governing IP which is why OIL is so important to you, okay? 
Okay, this is just a defense to copyright infringement. If you want to criticize something, if you want to do, if you want to use it as a teaching tool, generally you're immune from infringement liability. All right, infringement, and this is the part that you'll see in all IP. This spans all of IP. Infringement is simply a trespass. For example, in a patent you have, anybody knows what a patent claim is? At the end of a patent, there's a series of claims. Those claims define your invention. It's like the meets and bounds of your deed, right? When you bring an action for infringement of, of any type of IP, what you're saying is, get off my land by form of injunction or by form of damages. We'll talk about it in a little while. There are certain things you need to do with a copyright before you bring an action for damages. You need to send a copy of it into the, into the U.S. Library of Congress. That's how you register it. It's not, it's not a very complex process. Trademarks are a little bit different. Do you know, anyone know how trademarks started? Okay. If I was working in the 1200s and I was a furniture maker, what I would do is start to put my name inside my furniture. It became my mark, my quality. Without that, I don't have anything, right? No, after it leaves my, my furniture making facility, right, someone else could say, that's not Safier's, that's yours. Or you could make a replica of mine, right? And you could even copy it exactly, or they think exactly. But it still might not be mine, right? My mark makes it mine. This simply distinguishes something from somebody else's, right? So what are they? Coca-Cola, Ford Motor Company, 7-Eleven, Nike. This is the way modern companies perpetuate, some of the best companies, perpetuate the sales of their products and establish quality through the use of marks. Marks have different forms. Trademarks, service marks, trade names, trade dress. So for example, let me think of a trade dress. Oh. Well, the Coca-Cola bottle would be a trade dress, okay? Term, this is the best, ad infinitum. Coca-Cola will have that mark. My grandchildren will drink Coca-Cola. Their grandchildren will drink Coca-Cola. Unless, for some reason, we outlaw Coca-Cola, and then they'll drink some type of juice product that Coca-Cola owns, okay? Uh, legal protection. Again, same type of thing. Register the mark, right? It's necessary. Um, with a mark, it's the same type of action to get off somebody's mark. It's an infringement. With a mark, it's a little bit different. Here's the way you measure infringement with a mark. If I pick up two things and you look at it, and you're the consumer, the buyer of, of that product, are you confused? Yes, you infringe. This is the best. Someone's on your mark. Sue them. Tell them, get off my mark. You can get an injunction. If they violate the injunction, you know what you could do? Put them in jail. Um, in addition, give me money. Give me the money I would have made but for you taking my product and stealing it. That's what you can get. Counterfeit goods, you could get them confiscated, seized, destroyed. Get the bank accounts, go after those people all over the world, actually. It's an interesting concept. Okay, you have to register your mark. That before you do anything in a federal court. All right, trade secrets. Who knows what a trade secret is? It's not really the form of IP that I'm talking about because what are you doing? You're hiding things. You are hiding your trade secrets. Here, this is not what this is all about. But think about it. Sometimes you want to hide things. You want to keep them under lock and key. There are ways that the law protects trade secrets. People just can't break into your manufacturing facility and take your trade secrets. We can stop them. That's what the law does. All right, now this is, I think, what you're, what you're really looking for, right? And inventors often use patents to protect their discoveries, right? And wh again, what does a patent give you? It gives you an exclusive right to protect your invention. 
not the right to practice your invention. Okay? Now, they're granted by the United States Patent Office. They expire. And here's this quid pro quo that I'm talking about. You, the inventor, go to the patent office. You file a patent application. Once that patent application right, issues into a patent, you have now disclosed your invention to the public. All right? You did. That's your side of the bargain. I have disclosed it. I didn't have to. Could have left it a trade secret. I disclosed it. Because of that disclosure, the United, the disclosure, the United States government gives you a limited monopoly to exclude others, not practice yourself, to exclude others from practicing. So you saw Remicade before, right? Remicade is a billion dollar drug, billion something. What protects Remicade? Simply the patent protection of Remicade. But for the patent protection of Remicade, if not for the patent protection of Remicade, it would have had a generic Remicade within months. The inventors would have gotten very little on their R&D or for their R&D. Instead, they have royalties for years, right? Also, Johnson & Johnson has money in it, and so do, so someone else has some, uh, some part of the Remicade estate. Are there different types of patents? There are utility patents. I think that's what you guys are interested in, right? You want, you want to make some, a new invention that's useful. There are other patents. Um, who knows, who, who's Monsanto? Anybody do genetic modification of agricultural products? Monsanto, pretty big player, right? Uh, seed patents. So you can get a patent on a particular plant, right? A plant patent. You can also get a design patent, a completely ornamental patent. Composition of matter. Well, this, okay, well, so we have f under utility patents, you have new processes, right? A better process to do something, a machine, an article of ma manufacture, a composition of matter, or a new useful improvement. Now, let's talk about, anybody have a particular question about a type of patent in chemical or pharmaceutical arts? You said they were interested in... Okay, so we have clinicians, and you're walking around the clinic, and you, by serendipity, you say, you know, I'm treating people with uh, bipolar disorders. And they also have some other disorder. And you say, you know, you start scratching your head, and you start saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Right? Is there some connection here? Right? And then you start running an open-label study. No, don't. Don't do that. But you start running a study, or you start thinking about it, right? And you can carve out a method of use patent, right? A composition. I think I talk about things in terms of chemical compounds, right? Then compositions of chemical compounds, right? Then uses of chemical compounds. That's the way I do it. Um, because each of those gives you, believe it or not, a greater or less a sliver, right, of protection. Think about it this way. Um, if I have a new and useful compound, chemical compound, I can take that new and chemical compound to get a patent on the compound, right? I can put it in a formulation and have another patent on the chemical formula. Then I could use, I can layer that, right, with method of use patents also, okay? And then what I've done is I've built a thicket, a fence around that product. Right? such that it becomes impervious even if one of the patents fall. Right? And we'll talk about how patents fall. Okay, here are the requirements for a patent. You know, I have to tell you, if you ever read the Patent Act, this stuff seems real simple. Right? It's simple in concept, but I will tell you that these cases right, are thousands upon thousands in number defining the contours of each one of these concepts. When you, see, when you see 35 USC, you're talking about 35 United States Code Section 101. Very easy. Utility. For a patent to be issued, it has to be useful. And it also has to be 
statutory subject matter. Well, what's statutory subject matter? Well, that's an interesting question, right? Statutory subject matter, there's, there's been a couple different, let me give you the best quote I, that I've come across in the case law. But for the hand of man, it wouldn't exist. That's an interesting concept, right? But for the hand of man, it could, didn't, wouldn't exist. So for example, let's see, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Chakrabarty, and Chakrabarty invented an oil-eating bacteria, as I recall, right? And utility and stat patentable subject matter was an issue on whether Shacklebody's patent should have been issued. Right? Simple fact of the matter is, but by the hand of, of man, that would not have existed. Right? So Shacklebody's patent was okay. All right. What about um, statutory subject matter as an idea? Is an idea statutory subject matter? No. No, it's not. Uh, what about computer programs as statutory subject matter? It's a big debate today in the patent law. It's enormous debate in the patent law. It's really, not, it's really beyond what we're talking about today. Just know that whatever you invent has to, be, has to have some usefulness to it, and it has to be statutory subject matter, and then it fulfills the requirement of 35 U.S.C. 101. That doesn't mean that you get a patent. It just means that you have ticked off one of the boxes to get a patent. The next one, hmm? Genes. Ah, hmm. oh boy. I guess we're in a medical school, right? Um, traditionally, genes, gene patents, were granted for isolation of the gene. For example, gene exists in its own milieu in a human body. It doesn't exist in a test tube. It doesn't exist in a certain form. Now, when we say form, what does that mean? Now, you have to understand that the patent law is about lawyers trying to understand science. It's not the best situation in the world. And to compound it, right, words sometimes do not adequately describe ideas, right? So, a lot of cases on this issue. Novelty. Who knows what novelty is? Is it new? Is it new? You cannot patent something that's not new. Because the quid pro quo doesn't exist. If something's already in the public domain, you cannot patent it. You can't take it back and then get a limited monopoly on it. It's just not fair, right? So that's what novelty means. Non-obviousness. So that's another statutory requirement under 35 <laughs> USC 102. There's 35 U.S.C. 103, which is non-obviousness. Is this invention that you're describing an obvious derivation of something that came before it? If it is, what have you added? What have you added to the body of knowledge if what you're giving me is obvious to people who are skilled in that art? So you shouldn't get a patent, and you don't and it's rejected under, for obviousness under 103. There's different tests for these things. They're complicated issues of fact and law, um, but this is for your edification and for some, some brief understanding of what patent law is about. But these are very complex issues. This we, we kind of covered in uh, 101. Ideas are not covered. Inventions are, let's say, methods of uh, producing a biofuel instead of a fuel that burns cleaner. Uh, a way to prevent a slice in golf, very dear to my heart. Uh, I do need a golf club for preventing a slice. Um, a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, no, we need a process for capturing carbon dioxide. You see the difference between an idea and an invention. An invention has a couple different parts. An invention starts with an idea. It starts with a theory. It starts with an idea. But it ends with a reduction of that idea to practice. It is a useful embodiment of that idea. Right? It's not an idea. OK, here's the other requirements. 
the, the requirements I just showed you were for patentability and whether something is in the art or not, what we call in the art or not. These are other requirements that don't necessarily have to do with the invention by itself, but are requirements that you have to fulfill to the public. What does that mean? Enablement. It means, going back to this quid pro quo, you have to teach one of ordinary skill in the art how to practice your invention. It's not enough to tell you, oh, I have an invention and it does this. No, no, no. You have to teach it. You have to enable that person to be able to practice it so that when your limited monopoly is gone, the public is able to do what they want with it. Um, describe it. These, these are kind of wishy-washy standards um, and amorphous in many ways. But when you give a disclosure to oil, you come in and you say, this is what I invented and this is, this is the background. Um, you have to describe with some type of specificity what your invention is. You didn't invent the world. You invented a particular thing or a particular series of things. Right? Oftentimes, you don't realize it, but one specification, one disclosure can be carved up into many, many inventions. And then the last thing, which is probably overlooked sometimes, but it's pretty important, the claims of a patent, the last part of a patent that has claims to it. Let me see if I have something here. Um, I don't have patent claims with me, but I'll tell you this. The only thing that defines your invention are the claims of your patent. It's the only thing, those claims, are what defines your right to exclude. Okay? Sometimes you read a patent and you're kind of scratching your head and you're saying, wow, this, this is a pretty broad disclosure. And then you get to the claims and the claims are very narrowly drawn. It could be for a lot of reasons. It could be because there's a lot of prior art out there that disturbed the idea of novelty and utility and obviousness. And now the claim is very much narrower. That is what your right to exclude is, not what you've disclosed. That's another common mistake. People will come in to me and say, oh, he's infringing my patent. Why? Because in my specification, I told him how to do X, Y, Z. And then you look at the claims, they're nowhere near that broad, right? That's not infringement. Infringement is when a claim is understood by those of ordinary skill in the art and practiced outside the rights to the patent. Oh, here's an example. It was interesting that you picked a five series, what we call a five series, and I picked an eight series, right? Because this is the eight millionth patent that the US government issued. It happened in, in August, August 16th of 01. So eight million patents have issued. It's actually quite interesting. This particular patent um, is for someone with retinal degeneration, right? And it's very interesting. You should read it if you ever get a chance. Okay. The steps to get a patent are very, actually, Santa had a very um, intricate uh, schematic flowchart of getting a patent. Uh, for your purposes, I'll try and break it down. Get, in it, get a disclosure. The disclosure should, should involve what problem there was in the art, how you solved that problem, right? And specifically an embodiment of your invention that works. Once you do that, you're on your way. You have the beginnings of a patent application, right? Take it to tech transfer, right? Then they will guide you through this process. In a nutshell, you take that application, you clean it up, right? You send it to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Now, if you've included a set of claims it will be treated as a utility application if that's what you're applying for. If not, 
It can be treated as a provisional application. What does that mean? What does it mean, provisional? It means you're going to convert it later on into a utility application when you draft some claims. Do you have to? No. You could abandon it. It's still private when you abandon it. Right? So if you put in a provisional application and you never convert it to a utility, it stays private, essentially. Right? It's never published. If you convert it to a utility, it becomes published, and then it becomes part of the art. Right? So once you get that, once you submit your application to the patent office with a set of claims in a utility application, it will be examined. What does that mean? The United States Patent Office has, I don't know, how many people are in the patent office, Laura? Thousands now, right? Um, thousands of patent examiners, right? And they sit there, and when that application comes in, it gets categorized. This is biotech first, and it's biotech, and it's related to epigen, and, it and then it, all of a sudden it gets shunted to people who actually know about this stuff, right? And they sit there, and they do searches through databases, and they say, okay, is it useful? Is it uh, novel? Is it obvious, right, in light of these search results, right? And is it, is it enabled, right? Is it described? And what do those claims look like, right? And you go through this back and forth, this ping pong match between the applicant and the patent office, and hopefully, they call that prosecution, and hopefully at the end of it you get a patent grant by the US government that gives you a limited monopoly 20 years from the date of first application. Okay? Now that could be interesting to you. All right. Okay. All right. Since you're all here, right? before me and listening. Um, and this is for, for you guys, specifically as scientists, okay? Just to reiterate, the quid pro quo of you giving your information to the patent office in exchange for a US patent doesn't work <laughs> if you gave it away for nothing, okay? How do you give it away for nothing, right? What governs that is section 102 A and B, right? B is much worse. B is death. B is a forfeiture of your rights for this application, okay? And it states, the invention was patented or described in a, print pub in a printed publication in this or a foreign country or in public use or on sale in this country more than one year prior to the U.S. filing date. If you do this, you are not entitled to a U.S. patent under any circumstances. Okay. What, what's included in 102B? <coughs> public disclosures. Well, let's forget about lab notebooks for a minute. Let's look at examples of public disclosures. They're easy, right? If you think about it in terms of what I just told you, that you can't give something to the public and draw it back, then this becomes a simple concept. Publishing and enabling disclosure. So let me give you an example. Um, I have a new, use for al a new use of an old drug for Alzheimer's, right? And I say it's ABC used. 20, uh, 2 to 4 milligrams QD, right, for three weeks, right? That's my usage. That's my, that's my method of use. If I disclose the drug, I've probably given someone an enabling disclosure. If I haven't, and I've said, hey, Frank, I came up with a great idea, right, of treating Alzheimer's by using a drug two to four milligrams a day for two weeks. I didn't tell what drug it is. I didn't disclose ABC, right? That's okay. That's all right. No one can guess ABC, right? I have to tell them, right? That's a public disclosure. Give a talk or post a presentation at an open meeting. What does an open meeting mean? It means no one's under 
any type of obligation of confidentiality, right? So, generally, the three of us are working in a lab, right? I have an expectation that you're not going to take my invention, right, and disclose it, right? I might, now, I have an implied, right, confidentiality. It m would be much better if it was explicit. It would be much better when someone comes into the laboratory if I said, okay, sign here before you walk into my laboratory, promising that you won't disclose anything, right? That's what they mean by an open meeting versus a non-open meeting, right? It's not open if I tell David, David, you cannot say anything about this. It's no longer open, right? Could I have members who lied to the principal? Now, that's a question, right? That's a question. Usually, yes. You know why? Usually, usually, right, you're all under an obligation to give your invention to someone else. If that's true and you all share that, most often the law believes that you're okay, all right? But now you don't believe that, or not that you don't believe it. You go uptown, you go to Columbia, and you go to your buddy, and you walk in their lab, and you say, hey, what are you doing? Don't do this. Do that. I did it downtown. <laughs> gone. You're gone. Um, oh, that's my third bullet point. I didn't even know. Okay, so there you go, right? Uh, talking with, this goes without saying now, after you, after you understand the concept, talking with external parties about the invention without the use of a confidentiality agreement will clearly invalidate your patent and bar you from patenting. So it's up to you. Um, Except sometimes. Uh, these are, I'm running out of time, right? Okay. Um, this should go without saying now that you know about the quid pro quo. Posting messages in a blog. That's a great one. Of course not. Uh, enabling abstracts of grant applications. That is something that I think uh, OIL will handle with you and work with you on grant applications. Um, student theses. Interesting. You public a thesis. You know, I Googled myself the other day, uh, and I found a thesis that I did in 1987. It's actually bound, and I saw just the, just the, the front copy of it. And I never would have thought that something like that would have been accessible in that way, in broad brush, but it is. The fa simple fact of the matter is theses, once they're published anywhere, whether you could find them on Google or not, are in the art. Um, don't do that until you put your patent application in. Um, classrooms, that's another one. Sometimes professors love to talk about, hey, come to my lab. Work for me 23 hours a day for the next five years and get your PhD. And I have this interesting, very interesting uh, project that you could work on until you turn 35. <laughs> if that's the case and they want to uh, lure you in, right, they'll be talking about it. Uh, department seminars, just be careful with all of these things. You could talk in broad brush. You can talk about things, but remember something. If you are able, after a meeting, to go and practice that invention, it's enabled. You've sat through an enabling disclosure, okay? If you can't, if you don't know the name of the drug, you haven't. Um, handouts, obviously. They can be problematic. Let's see. Uh, lab meetings, when you're under the, the auspices of a confidentiality agreement. Faculty meetings, they're clearly closer to the university. Uh, confidential submissions for publications. Publications, by the way, um, the case law says that it's not a public disclosure, it's not a printed publication until the journal publishes it. Okay, so just because it's accepted doesn't mean that it's right. Uh, oh, this is important for you guys. You, you, there's a lot of tension. Um, I did some work for Yale recently. There's always a lot of tension between what you need as professors, graduate students, etc., cetera, and, and the patent system. Because you can't throw things into the public uh, domain so easily, but you want to, don't you? 
you want to brag a little bit. You want to say, this is my work. This, was, this is important. You want to put it into the Journal of Cell Biology. It's, it, it's, it's a nature of science. You want to, you want to spread the word. Uh, it's progress of science, right? You just have to be careful with it. You can publish. Just operate within the guidelines of oil. Um, you can continue. You can do all of these things. You can apply for funding. You can give presentations. I will tell you, when you give presentations, be very careful. If you want some case law for your files, we can supply that to you uh, about what can be in the presentation and, and how much can be disclosed. Um, there's some case law that says that a couple slides out of a large presentation, even if it fully discloses an invention, may not be a disclosure. But don't try and make those decisions yourself. It's not worth the forfeiture okay, that goes along with it. Um, let's see if I have anything else for you. Um, do you want me to continue with this? Keep going? Okay. Um, when to file. And this, again, we have the same, it's almost strategic in a way. Um, if your grants, if, 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 you, if publication is so important to you, right, that you need to do it, um, let's say by August 1st, right, work with oil. Tell them that you need to publish. Make sure that not 12 months goes by, right? Maybe put in your provisional application. These are things that you need to do. This was really talking about just be careful. Be very, very careful. Protect your rights before you start to do things that put your invention in the public domain, OK? They will help you do that. Patent attorneys will help you, but we are too expensive. So you should be using oil, right? And they will go out and hire patent attorneys and help with the application process. Right. Um, these are other considerations. Um, I'll tell you a quick story, and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, I was asked by Roche to go up and look at a small company um, it started with a couple people, and they, I don't know, for whatever reason, Roche became very involved and, and loved the technology. So I was in, I, I go up to, uh, I'm not going to tell you where. So I, go, so I go out, and uh, I start interviewing the people who were the head of the laboratories, and I said, could you show me some of your lab notebooks? Sure. So I said, who else, who else worked on this project be, besides you and you, A and B? And, no, no, just A and B. We started this company, it's just A and B. A and B for five years. That's the only guys who worked here. All right. So he shows me the first lab notebook, C. C's right there on the front cover, Mr. C. Doesn't even work for the company, right? So right there, the value of the company went plummeting, right? Not really. But what I'm saying is lab notebooks are extremely important to you and to the university. They are the proof of your invention, the proof of when the invention occurred, how you did it, when you did it, and why you did it. Okay, be very careful with them. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? PCT? You going back to PCT? No, this is actually okay. about genomics. And, okay. You know, this is a big team science now. Uh, it's great. There might be an idea, but there might be ten different centers that are all yeah. uh, enrolling patients, and then yeah. biostatistician and bioinformatics. Right. Is everybody a inventor or the person that came up with the idea? And, and, and there's, there's so many potential sort of leaky okay. of, um, uh, opportunities for the information to trickle out. How, how do you Here's what the courts say. Here's what the courts say. If all that person is, is a pair of hands, it's not an inventor. Right? It takes more than being a technician to be an inventor. It gets to be very slippery. It is very slippery. First of all, inventorship, you know, is a claim by claim analysis. So if I have 20 claims in a patent, you two might be the inventor on five, you two might be the inventor on three. It's a very, very difficult analysis to make. But that, as a general rule, technical people are not. Where you get in trouble in a university is Professor so and so is the best in the business. Not only that, he's the most powerful person on the university, right? He goes on all the papers, right? Is he an inventor? 
What did he bring to the table? Where's the inventive idea? Now, it could be that Dr. So-and-so is. I'm his graduate student. I go in, doctor, you know what? I've been thinking about this and this. What do you think? Safia, you know, I know you're dumb as a post. Why don't you do A, right? He's an inventor. He's an inventor. But it's not so easy to determine on a regular basis. And when you start sharing between universities, it becomes very difficult. But generally, if all we're talking about is data collection, right, and statistical analysis, that doesn't, to me, spell invention, right? Now, if you're looking at the person who put the mathematics together to figure out what the relationships are, that gets a little better. Sir? Reason A, obvious, not novel. Reason B, obvious, not novel. Nobody puts A and B together. Is Interesting. That, is that obvious? Obvious, not no. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. OK. I'm usually, I usually love blackboards, but OK. So, so we have A that's obvious and known. Right? A is obvious and known. And B as well. And B is obvious and known. That's right. So nobody put them together. But it's, uh, but, but, it's but, but it's the combination. Is the combination obvious? Right. Is the combination obvious? Right. I'm not sure. Well, here's your real problem. How much did you get per hour? Here's your problem. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to solve it for you right now. Right? I might save you 40000 in this five, next five minutes. Right? If A and B are species of C, which is the overall relationship? No good. Because you can't pull A and B out of the prior art. Now, the rela what you're talking about is science in a pure form. That is, right, trying to develop the relationships between A and B, right? That's not an invention. That's a relationship, right? I would say, given the facts, now I'll be a lawyer, right, given what you just told me, right, I don't believe, but I'd have to do research. It might take 40 hours. Could cost you $50,000. But other than that, I would say that if all you're doing is putting A and B and finding a relationship, what you've actually done, you know genus-species relationships? So what I think you've done is taken two species that work and say, why do they work? That's different. That's different. Now, if you could tell me that you have, you've isolated the structure activity relationship and you get a new compound, then we'll do that on a contingency. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much.